All right, good morning. morning. You know, uh, the power that creates the entire universe, the power that is maintaining and sustaining all of this is the same power, the same presence, the same activity that exists within each and every one of us right now. So in the science of mind, we believe that there is something back of everything and that that something is what Ernest Holmes calls in our textbook the first cause. It's, it's everywhere. You know, so if you would imagine um, uh, a balloon, right? Pick your favorite color balloon, whatever that may be for you. And imagine you blow up the balloon and you're holding the blown up balloon in your hand. Now, in the science of mind, we would say that if you're the balloon, right? The air inside the balloon is God. The air outside the balloon is God. And oh, by the way, the balloon that you think is you is also part of God. Right? So there's no, there's no place where, where any of it ends, where God leaves off or you or I begin. Right? Um, it's, it's not fully uh, realized or released by means of us just yet. The more we realize it, the more we give way to its expression out in the world, the better our life gets. I believe that that's how the teaching works. I know this because the power within us has limitless possibilities for our development. If you look at your own life and think about how you have achieved, you have accomplished things that at some earlier time you thought were perhaps not possible to you, but we've all done it, haven't we? We've all had those experiences where we thought at some point, ah, that's not available to me. And then however we moved along that direction, we actually found ourselves in, in, in possession of that experience, right? So I think we have to tune in to it to release it in a greater way in our life, in our body of affairs. And so what that feels like to me is, first of all, I have to become aware of it. So I have to remind myself God dwells within me as me. And then I'm willing for God to fill my mind and my thoughts and express through my actions in the world in which I live because the power can do all things. See, this is, I think, the brilliance of the science of mind, is that the power that we are talking about that's everywhere and within us is a power that can do all things. It can heal. It can multiply. It can figure all kinds of stuff out that I have no way of knowing. Right? So I believe that with God, all things are possible. That's a promise that we read in the scriptures. And so it is the source, that principle, that power, that presence within us is the source of all wisdom, all intelligence, all love, all illumination. You know, when I face any difficulty, a, a, a problem to solve, a, a healing, I desire, whatever, I like to say, through the power of God within me, I am beyond this. So I use that as a starting point for my prayer because when I start the prayer, I want to know that the prayer is already answered. So I'm already at the end of the prayer with the solution, with the healing. So through the power of God within me, I know that I am beyond this condition because I know probably for all of us, when we're faced with some conditions, they seem so big, so overwhelming, we think, oh my God, how will I ever get past this? This is going to be the thing that takes me down. This is it. This is it. I, bet, I, I guess I just better start packing it in because it's all over for me. You know, I mean, so this is like saying, you know, through the power of my higher mind, through the power of love, through the power of the infinite intelligence that created the universe, through the power of the best that is within me, you know, I am able to move beyond whatever this current experience is. Because I think we have a really inexhaustible resource within us. So somebody who's a favorite of mine, Mark Twain, said, a better idea than my own is to listen. <laughs> that was great. Just a better idea. You know, because I don't know about you, but I talk to myself all day long from the time I get up in the morning. You know, the committee's in session. We're having a fabulous time, you know. And, and if we do what Mark Twain says, a better idea than my own is to listen, then I think that honors our own inner wisdom. You know, he's not talking about listening to what's outside of you. He's talking about listening, I believe, to what's at the deepest recesses of our being. So isn't it obvious if we're having difficulty, we're probably not fully in touch with the resources that are within us. And Science of Mind says everything you need already exists within you. So, you know, well, God, but, but I'm having difficulty in this particular area, in this relationship or this situation. I just don't understand because I'm not paying attention. I'm not accessing. I'm not believing in that there are resources within me, which if I had my hands on, 
then this would all be infinitely better than it is right now. See, I think we, we habitually focus and give our attention to what we don't want. I talk to a lot of people in the course of the week, and I find this pretty much across the boards, that everybody, when, when it comes right down to it, is giving a little more attention to what they don't want than to what they do want. And you know, they, they, they have it in more detail. They talk about it more frequently. So I think we, we habitually focus and give our, if we habitually focus and give our attention or more of our attention to what we don't want, you know, it's where, it's where the general tendency of your focus goes. It's where the general tendency of your energy, your effort, your mental work, where are we thinking most of the time? If you think of the scale of Lady Liberty, I love that image of Lady Liberty holding the scale, you know? And if I, you know, so, so say the scales are perfectly equal, and I do just a little more to the negative, the scale's going to tip in that direction, which is why it's so important that we be life-affirming in our thinking, in our conversation, and what we say to each other, and what we say to ourselves, and what we say to our children and our parents, and when we're driving by people on the street, what we say is so important because it all contributes to which way the scale goes. Humanly, I may not know the answer to the predicament I'm in. But Ernest Holmes was very clear about that. He said, but there is a power and a presence within me that does know. And I have direct access to that power and that presence. But I have to listen to it, which in my case means I need to stop talking for a few minutes and get really quiet and say, OK, spirit within me knows what I need to do. I'm willing to know. So show me, God, in a way I understand. You know how thick I can be. Show me in a way I understand. Make it really plain. And then I get quiet. And you know, sometimes it feels like nothing comes to me. And that makes me crazy. It really does. Like, wait a minute. I got quiet. I did my part. Now you do your part. And so I remain quiet. And sometimes, honestly, nothing comes. So I say, well, OK, it's going to be provided down the road at some point. And usually, when I pick up with my life and go on about my day, at some point, quote, out of the blue, something comes into my head, and it gives me exactly what I needed. But I know I had to go through that whole process to get there. So humanly, we may not know. But what's essential for us as students of the science of mind is that we do know, that we do believe that there is a principle, a power, a presence within us that knows exactly what we need to know, what we need to do, how we need to be to make circumstances and experiences in our life better. And you say, well, how is this possible that we have direct access to this power? Well, it, that power is our very life. So for me, I experience that power with my mind. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I try to be open. I try to be receptive to it. I have faith. I take time to remind myself every day that there is a power within me that knows. It knows. It knows. Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, faith, faith is a state of mind. I think it's a way of thinking. You know, now I would say we all have faith in something, but you know, I come back to this idea of faith, honest to God, on a daily basis, that it's, it's a way of thinking. It's an inner knowing. Now, for us in science of mind, at least in the early stages, it's based on spiritual laws, laws that are always in operation. It's based on trust. You know, so I trust that God, that life is for me, and I hope that you do as well. I hope that your thinking, your general thinking is that life, God, spirit, the universe is for you. That it's all working on your behalf for the greatest good, the greater good for you and your life. See, there, this is a way to approach life. I have tried other approaches. I'm sure you have too. Um, I was not very happy with the results I experienced from other approaches, which is part of what made science of mind so incredibly appealing for me. Um, in Isaiah, it says, thou shalt uh, keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, which I think is a very simple way of saying focus on God. Just keep focusing on God and everything will be okay. Thee is that presence of God, that principle of perfect life within us. Oh yeah, that's right, I have to remember that, that there is a principle and that is a principle that it's a principle of perfect life and that already exists within me. I don't need to add anything. Right? That we just want to recognize what is within us already. You know, if, you, if we think we're small, if we think we're not much, that's how life will appear to us. Because our thought is creative. If we think we're small, if we think we're not much, that's how the universe and all of the people in it, everyone around us, will respond to us. 
Not because that's the truth that God created about us, but because that's what we believe about ourselves. Our thought's creative. We put it out there in the universe. The universe has to mirror that back to us. You know? But who are we punishing and limiting with this kind of thinking? You know, just us. You know, I'm only hurting me. If we think other people are the ones that have the greatness within them, that they are so, so special, you know, but we don't have any of that within us, within our experience, then spiritual law makes that so. Look, everybody comes into life with different gifts. Everybody has gifts, though. There is nobody who doesn't have some kind of gift. Although whenever I say this, I, I, I always remember a woman who was in my office, and I asked her what, I thought, what she thought her gift was, and she told me, in all seriousness, I swear, she told me in all seriousness that she thought her gift was that she could see <laughs> what was wrong, the faults in other people. <laughs> I told her that was not a gift, uh, that it was something else, and, uh, and we'll just move on from there. Uh, see, see ach achievement in the outer world, achievement in the outer plane comes from consciousness, we teach. You know, this is another way of saying that it's not what we do, but who we are on the inside that's producing, that's contributing to the greater part of our life experience. Who are we? That's the most important thing. You know, you say, well, why? Why is that such a big deal? Because the principle we work with is that it's a principle of one life, you know, and who we are. You know, if you know that you are spirit, that you are a son or daughter of the Most High God, that you are ex an expression of life, of love, of creativity, of joy, that that's who you are, that penetrates every area of your life. That means it's going to affect your relationship and your job and your, uh, uh, your money. It's going to affect everything. Nothing is going to be untouched by that. Right? So to work on my consciousness means to be more aware, I think, of, of God, of the spirit of God, the presence of God in every moment more aware of our nature, which is love, and the nature of other people, which is also love, whether they're recognizing or expressing it or not. So how do the most conscious beings act? You know, this is what I, I, I'm interested in. I think, all right, well, if I look at Jesus, I would say, well, Jesus, he was a pretty loving guy. He was a pretty loving guy. Rarely, rarely, OK, never. <laughs> I'm just trying to be nice about it. but. Uh, do we, do we see an angry healer? I remember um, some years back, we, we were on Maui, and, uh, and we went in this, uh, you know, and Hawaii has uh, lots of these little, very relaxed neighborhoods. That's a nice way to put it. Very, very relaxed, chilled out neighborhoods. So we're in a store, and I'm talking to this woman, and, and she's going on and on about how she can't stand this place, this particular place, because it's all these, all these hippies, all these hippies. And she's going on and on about how she hates these hippies, you know? And, and so at some point, I figured, well, best to change the subject. So I asked her, I said, well, when you're not working here in, um, I don't know, it was like a gift store or a thrift store. I don't remember exactly. I said, what do you do? You know, what, what, else, what else do you do? And she said, I'm a healer. <laughs> and, and at that point, I thought, just don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. And I said, OK, but you have a really nice day, and aloha to you. And I kept going. And I got outside the store, and I was like, ah! <laughs> I was like, See, it's, I was dying, dying to say, how's that working for you, darling? You know, I mean, I was just dying to say, because, you know, the, because as within, so without. You don't see an angry healer. Think about it. How can somebody who's really angry on the inside possibly facilitate healing? You know, because what's inside is what's coming out. You know, it's this recognition that we are expanding our ability to receive in a greater way what's already within us. You know, everything in our life, I think, is an opportunity to bring more God, more love into the world. Um, so I was reading this story this week. And uh, this uh, young couple, they had two small children. And, uh, and the daughter, who was um, just a couple of years old, I think about three years old, um, she had some very rare disease. And they needed to find someone who was the perfect match uh, for a blood match, for a blood donor, which seems like it would be really easy, but she had a very rare type of blood. 
And so they um, are looking around, looking around, looking around, and lo and behold, they realize that her five-year-old brother is actually the match for her blood. And so um, they, uh, the parents sit down with him, and the doctor says, you know, um, would you be willing, would you be willing to give us your blood so that your sister, your little sister, could live. And he got this really kind of perplexed look on his face and said, can, can, I, can I think about this for a day? And they said, well, sure, sure. So he took a day and thought about it, and, and he stayed pretty close to his little sister, who was quite ill. And then he said, yeah, he was, he was willing to do this. And so the way they decided to do it is they put them on beds next to each other. And uh, the parents were there, and the doctor. And so because he was just a child, they took just a half a pint of blood out of him first. And they, they showed him the half a pint, and then they it, it put that half a pint into his sister. And, and she immediately, you, they, he could see the change. Her coloring changed, and he, he was seeing like that she could actually feel better. And they said, OK, well, now we're going to take the next half pint. And he said, OK. And then he looked at them and he said, will it hurt when I die? So nobody had explained to him that they weren't going to take all of his blood. No, really. And that they were just going to take part of it. And he assumed that if they were going to take his blood, they were going to take all of it. But he was willing, is the extraordinary thing. He was willing to do that for his little baby sister, which, I, you know, when I read that, it just wiped me out. I just thought, wow, that is just so incredible. You know, there, it, it, do we really think there is any area of our life or the world that we live in that would not be benefited by a little more love? You know, when we put the energy of love into the world, that's, that's an extraordinarily attractive vibration. We become magnetic, you know? Then we're in tune with the power, and it really has the capacity to flow through us. You know, if you think about great artists and great inventors and great writers, they have access to the divinity within themselves, whether they call it that or not. And what they are accessing is a place within themselves that's unlimited, that they're just expressing what, what's there. And, and, and so often, people who do some artistic expression will tell you that their best work happens when their personality gets out of the way, and they just sort of become the vessel, and it happens through them. You know? Now, that doesn't mean they don't practice at their craft, you know? but when, they, when, when the time comes for the performance or whatever, that it just happens through them. Now, I realize that every person here is different, thank you, God. That's a good thing. It is a good thing. If we were exactly the same, that would mean the duplicates would not be necessary. right? So it's important that we are all different. Now, I, I th also think that you know, this means that we don't have to compete with each other because we're supposed to be different. You know? and, 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 in, and just general in life, I think competition is because there's some belief in lack. right? It's fear. It doesn't feel good because it's just not the truth in that way. Truth, it seems to me, truth always feels good. Now, that, that good might be unfamiliar at first if what we're used to is feeling bad. Right? But if we know that we are all children of God, valuable and unique, and we all have equal access to the power, and it's working through us, what's all the worry and stress about? What is all the stress about? The power is there, but if we act like it's not there, it will certainly seem like that is so. Yeah. So where there is worry and stress, we are believing in a power other than God, right? That we think we're doing it, and, and, and actually we're not, because we're not trusting it. You know, Ernest says, there's a power for good in the universe, and you can use it. We are here to learn to work intelligently with this power, you know? And then ultimately to allow this power to work through us. So at first, I think that means that I'm filling the balloon. And then later, it means the balloon gets filled without my even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So using the power lifts us from feeling at effect in life, you know, like it's being done to me. Feeling, it lifts us from feeling helpless and depressed or broke or sick or alone. And as we become more and more convinced of the goodness of this power, we have a reservoir of experience that we allow the power to work through us again and again and again. So let's tell the truth. Our life is not the way it is because of externals. 
because of our spouse or our job or money or any of those things. Our life is the way it is because of the internal things like how we really are on the inside. That's the roadmap. That's what's really important, how we're being on the inside. If we knew we could not be separate from God, I think we would live a different life. And I don't know how that looks for you, but I have some sense of how that looks for me. If I knew I could not be separate from God, and God, that means God in and through all people and all things, I would live my life a little differently. Now, I, I, I feel like I'm on track, I'm moving in that direction, but I don't remember it every single moment of every single day. And so that's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm after. You know, um, in, uh, in Genesis, in the Bible, it talks about uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, there's the tree of life, and that tree of life is very important because it shows up in Christian tradition, in Judaism, in uh, Islam. You know, there's also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and I've thought about this a lot, and this was fascinating to me that Adam and Eve were in paradise until they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They, were not, they could do, eat anything in the garden, just go and buy this, don't touch this one tree. And of course, that's what they had to do. Now, I don't think that was a bad thing. I don't think ultimately that was a bad thing. Um, because ultimately what happens is it got humanity on uh, a track of evolution. You no, know, that it forced uh, humanity to start to do what we needed to do to grow spiritually. But um, I was talking about the tree. Oh, yeah. So because they ate from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, that symbolically represents two powers. You know, up until that point, they were in paradise. Everything was good. It was all good. It was all God. There was nothing else. But then when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there's now duality. There's good and bad. There's abundance and lack. There's sickness and health, right? So we could say that eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was they started to believe that God was not all there was, right? So we cannot keep doing what we've been doing and somehow hope that things will get better in any area of our life. You know, uh, that some people are kind of like a hamster on a wheel with their issue. We know these people. You know, they just, they're dealing with the same issue. If you don't talk to them for 10 years and you check in again 10 years later, they're still dealing with the same issue. And by, when I say dealing with the same issue, I mean dealing in an ineffective way. Yeah. Okay. So, so we must put new wine in a new skin, right? New thinking, new ways of being, new consciousness. You know, the, I think... Um, I heard somebody say it like this recently, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, apologize in advance before I say it, okay? Uh, that the world is tired of your labor pains, have the baby, give birth to something new. Yeah, that's it. And I thought about that. The world is tired of your labor pains. You, know, uh, you say, but, oh, and I know, because people think, but you're not dealing with the people I'm dealing with, or the situations I'm dealing with, the difficulties I'm dealing with. No, I'm not. I have my own. Thank you very much, you know. Uh, and, 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 and we all do. You know, we all do. Uh, sometimes people think, oh, if, I, if I'm really practicing the science of mind correctly, there will never be problems. But that is not true because, you know, um, things just require, life requires maintenance. You know, things require uh, time and fixing and, and things wear out. And because things wear out doesn't mean it's bad consciousness on your part. It probably means that you've actually been uh, using life fully. You've been embracing it fully. Right? Uh, and I think that where I am with it now is that basically the difficult people that show up in our life, they come into our life to show us where our own blocks are. That's what they're there for. They're showing us something about ourselves. Blocks to what? Well, to more love, more good, more peace of mind. They're showing me where I need to start to put some consciousness. Because when I do, that means my life gets better. There's a Chinese saying that life is like a ball of twine. Yeah. You can throw the ball in a general direction, but no one can predict how it will unwind. All right? So um, Edmund Hillary, I'm sure you, you know his name, tried to climb Mount Everest and failed. But his attitude was great. He said in a speech, I will defeat you, Everest, because you cannot get any bigger, and I can. I love that. I thought that was great. And he did in May of 1953. So I know we get close sometimes, 
And then sometimes we do something that seems to sabotage ourselves. And to me, I think what that always is an indication of is that fear has gotten in there. That I've let fear and doubt go untended. Mm -hmm. um, a psychiatrist announced to a patient after nine years of intensive therapy, you are cured. Uh, and then he looked at the patient and said, well, what, what's wrong? You, you don't look happy. And she said, oh, well, sure, it's great for you. You have a patient who's cured. You can tell people about that. But try to see it from my point of view. Just a few years ago, I was Joan of Arc. Now I'm nobody. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are all somebody. We are all somebody. The important thing is that we remember who we are spiritually. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just remember that right here where we are, spirit is. Infinite love, intelligence, creativity, joy, abundance, all of the qualities, all of the attributes of God exist within us. We are surrounded and filled with each and every one of them. And as I know this is true for me, I know it's true for every person here, for every beloved soul. We are all made in the image and likeness of God. God, our father, mother. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for each and every one of us. And whatever it is that troubles our heart today, large or small, I know that that spirit of God within us is great enough to more than handle it. And so we invite that presence to fill our mind and express through our heart and our words and be in every action we take in the world. Because I know that that spirit of God within us is greater than any seeming difficulty. And so we include in our prayer our family members and friends, parents and children, loved ones. Whoever we hold near and dear today, we see them in our mind's eye and we wrap our spiritual arms around them. And we know that right where they are, God is present. Healing, restoring, renewing, being its greatest, best self by means of them. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world, so all of those things that pull at our attention, we say God is present right there, even in the midst of that. God is present. There's no time, no place where God's light, God's love, God's healing is absent. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up for each and every one of us. And so with a full heart, I say, thank you, God, that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, amen.